Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm Heidi Zimmerman, Executive Director at AWT. And just one quick housekeeping note, you'll notice that when you signed in, you're in listen-only mode, but we do encourage your participation. So go ahead and type any questions you have into the little chat box on your screen, and we'll take those at the end. So with that, let me introduce our speaker today. Tom Tin Tinney is the Sales Director and Director of Engineering at Lakewood Instruments. Tom is a U.S. Air Force veteran with over 20 years in the water treatment equipment industry for cooling towers, boiler process, and reverse osmosis control system. Tom is a presenter at AWT's training program and chairman of the membership committee. In his spare time, he writes and publishes science fiction novels. So at this point, I'd like to turn the program over to Tom. Thanks, Heidi. Uh, thanks uh, for everybody for attending. Um, today, we're going to talk about cooling tower boiler control uh, Building management system integration, uh, and this is this has become a bigger and bigger deal, and I think that more people are seeing that as part of their baseline requirement to acquire new business, or uh, even some of their current business is rolling over to it as uh, uh, mergers and acquisitions and property management companies become involved in monitoring the condition of the site. So. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and jump into it. These are kind of straight ahead, not pretty slides. Uh, you know, no, nothing too cute. And uh, I'm just going to roll through this, and then uh, when we get to the questions, hopefully we'll have some good ones. Uh, what I want to do is uh, I'm going to call it a 30,000, 15,000 foot view. We'll we'll get into some of the minutia. Uh, uh, what we're probably not going to do is get into some site-specific uh, configurational stuff. That's not what this is. This isn't that deep a presentation. But it's the stuff we can have a conversation about uh, after the meeting if you guys uh, want to use the information that's provided to contact me. So um, the the integration protocols. Uh, the first one, of course, we had for years and years is what we call the 4 to 20 milliamp. So we're going to look at the types of interfaces first. 4 to 20 milliamp, Lawnworks, which is the twisted pair, uh, uh, Modbus 485, and, and now IP, and BACnet, MSTP, which is a twisted pair set of wires, or TCIP, which is an Ethernet type connection. We're going to talk about the expansion of data points that are being sent, the differences between the, the different uh, protocols. Uh, the two-way communication versus the one-way communication street, a little quick uh, brief on that. Uh, Off-site data collection and why it's become a big deal. Um, the Internet and BMS, Building Management System Interface, security concerns. Some integration steps and concerns that you may have uh, be facing and some of the steps you'll need to take to, to um, uh, alleviate those. And then we'll go into some questions. So this isn't going to be a really long presentation, but uh, hopefully we'll give you some good information. All right, so the types of interfaces that I'm going to deal with today uh, are the two-wire transmitter, 4 to 20 milliamp, uh, of course, Lawnworks, Modbus, and uh, BACnet. Uh, there's Profibus, there's CANbus, there's a few other device-to-device uh, -device protocols, uh, but in our industry, these are the, typically the four that we see, um, and these are common to the bigger integrators like Johnson Controls and Siemens. They are, they're all very familiar with these, these particular interfaces, so that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, the 4 to 20 milliamp was the grandfather of them all. Uh, it was a device that would proportionally transmit a signal uh, that relative to a reading. So uh, a conductivity signal on a sensor, uh, if the sensor was out in the air, it would read 4 milliamps. And as you put it into a higher and higher conductivity, it would have, a, let's say, a limit set of 10,000 micromoles, and that would give a 20 milliamp signal. Uh, the first 4 milliamps of every signal was to power the remote device, so whether it's a transmitter, or, or not. Uh, they did try 0 to 20 milliamp, uh, where the device didn't require uh, um, any sort of additional power, and that was to give a slightly wider or, or more definitive point-by-point -point range across that 20 milliamps. But, uh, you know, that's, that, that wasn't as popular, but it is used. Uh, the pros of it, it was, uh, it was reliable. It's, it's a stable for years. Proportional pumps are done this way. A lot of the proportional equipment that needs to run at a specific rate when, uh, against a specific value, this was a straight-ahead proposition for them. It's the most basic interface. Everybody universally understands it. However, it's, it's old, it's long in the tooth, and uh, we think that there's going to be more transitions away from that as technology advances. Uh, the cons of that is that the, the proportional signal only captures one parameter. It can drive up and down based on one single reading. That's it. Uh, multiple 4 to 20 milliamp devices, uh, even if they're close together, you have to do individual wire runs or, or pairs of wire runs to each device and bring those back into the building management system or the, the, the main control system 
So th that causes a lot of infrastructure cost. It also causes a lot of pre-planning. And, and if you want to need to alter something or move a piece of equipment, now you're moving not only the power for that equipment and the plumbing for that equipment, but all the interface wires now have to be moved too individually. Uh, and it cannot communicate with more than one interface system at a time. There is a way to kind of have a number of item, number of uh, building management devices or interface devices kind of pick off the signal and measure it on the fly. Um, but that can lead to something we call ground looping, which means there's currents flowing around the building chewing things up. Uh, by the way, guys, uh, everybody, uh, I talk really fast. So uh, I, I'll try to slow it down a little bit, but it is one of the things I do. Um, so four to 20 milliamp, uh, it's an old standby. It's still out there. There are a lot of devices that run by it. Uh, the most basic controllers will include it just for the straight ahead connection. Uh, Modbus has been around for years. This is a device-to-device a, a -device protocol. It wasn't specifically set up for our industry, but it is out there and it does its thing, twisted pair. It allows uh, multiple pieces of information to be sent back and forth. Um, that's, that's, a, that's a plus. Uh, the more information can, per device can be exchanged. It was an ever-evolving uh, uh, protocol. Uh, the format's time-tested in the, you know, Industrial devices out there use it. Industrial protocols use it. Process controllers and PLCs use it. So it, it's definitely out there. One of the issues is you can only master one server, and devices tend to only be mastered to one server. From our perspective, that means that the devices don't really function on their own well, and they don't talk device to device. Everything is done in a master-slave mode. Um, it's not specifically oriented towards our water treatment industry. It's for all interconnectivity. And that means that the, the Johnsons and the Siemens guys that are doing a whole building may like Modbus, or in the old days might have liked Modbus, especially if they were running a product line. But it, it, the actual controllers and the, the nuances for our, what we do for heating, cooling, and all that aren't necessarily the focus of Modbus. It, it does work, though. And it, realistically, it's rapidly being supplanted by other protocols, specifically for us, BACnet. Uh, BACnet is kind of the one that that's becoming the predominant in the industry, and we'll talk about that in a minute and why that is. Uh, Lawnworks has been around forever, uh, started by Echelon Company. Uh, the cool thing about Lawnworks, uh, there's, and I'm not going to read this, you, you can actually go on Wiki and pick up all this uh, the uh, information. I suggest you do it too. If you're more interested in the origin of the protocol languages, go to Wiki. Uh, uh, there's a good sections and good references on all the stuff and, and what it's about. So, But uh, Lawnworks is a uh, twisted pair based. Uh, the cool thing is the, the company that started Echelon standardized on Lawnmark. So basically all the manufacturers were manufacturing the devices and using all the protocols in a very specific way. Uh, virtual messaging system, the, the, that meant that the device could be sending readings along and also there was a subset that allowed individual messages to be sent between devices for monitoring and configuration purposes. Again, that was cool. Uh, multiple ins and outs can be transmitted over a shared network. There was no traffic management, uh, so you didn't, you weren't worried about like with Modbus, who was taking this particular time slot to send information. Law, uh, with Lawnworks, everybody just was on the network and blasting it and grabbing each other whenever they needed to. Uh, devices can be bound to multiple devices, so there was no master slave. I could have a, a connectivity sensor tied to a relay, tied to an alarm light, tied to uh, some other portion of of the system, just through the initial lawn server, and then the lawn server was out of the picture. The devices all talked to each other, which was, again, cool. A standardized chipset. Every device used the same chips to do this transmission. So there was no worry about whether they met the standard of Lawnworks because they were built that way. And there was that allowed for consistent interface. Uh, cons, it had, it's been completely supplanted by the new protocols. Uh, it's really popular still in, in the uh, energy industry. And uh, the, what we call people tracking, where the individual devices through a building may look for to turn on lights if people are in the room, uh, to change the temperature in the room when people are, are, you know, to reroute the heating and venting when there's nobody in a particular portion of the facility. Uh, that's where it's being used today a lot. However, it is also one of the baseline devices that BACnet relied on when they were doing their initial design. So it, does, it is still functional within our industry and flexible within our energy, industry. Uh, the other con was uh, to set up a lawn work system as a building management system. Uh, there was all kinds of licensing and fees and buying, I'm going to say chips for lack of a better word. Uh, you know, you bought, bought credits and then you use them as you commission devices. And 
it was an insane scheme. I think Echelon has backed way off of that since they've now taken control of the chipset manufacturing. Uh, it also requires a very specific skill set to be able to in implement it and use the LAN server as a baseline uh, when you're doing the setup. So uh, it's not super friendly, super easy, or super easy to interface with. However, over time, the individual devices have proven to be very reliable. We've manufactured some ourselves since 1994 was when we first got into LAN, and there's devices out there just still chugging away, and what's that? So that's like 23 years. They're just, they're really solid devices. Um, one of the cool things about it, when you talk about the twisted pair, is the, the like a, a sensor can be local to a, a node, and that node then can be run 1,300 feet with twisted pair from the control system. They could be daisy chained too. So halfway there, we could have another node split the daisy chain. So we, from an infrastructure standpoint, we were able, rather than to run an individual twisted pair out to a single device, I could plan for a daisy chain through the facility and have these devices all on the same little mini network and that saved me some infrastructure costs. The other cool part about the lawn stuff was they've implemented the uh, 9.1 megahertz transceivers, which uh, basically act like a little remote and they can be up to five miles away from each other now, everybody on the same transceiver. So very cool that the, the technology had reached that point, but again, a very mature technology, not really being picked up as the new way to do things, but it'll be out there for a while. Backnet, backnet's the, 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 the big boy on the block now. Everybody's rolling to backnet, not everybody. A majority of people are rolling to backnet. New building specs are calling for backnet. They want the, the heating, cooling, venting, air conditioning, lighting. They want all that stuff run in the backnet protocol. Johnson Controls is pushing it. Siemens is pushing it. Uh, a company, there's companies like Tritium that are out there that are really oriented towards it. Now, let me say this. It's an open source. So when BACnet was first done, they said, here's the protocols and here's how you use them. Just implement them how you need to implement them. Great plan. Uh, I'm going to uh, liken that to Linux. Remember Linux? Linux was an operating system. It was open source. It was shared with everybody. Then towards the end, companies like Red Hat and even Microsoft at one point tried to pull Linux in and make their own version. That is the same thing that's happened with the big building integration companies. They're pulling it in and making their own version and then creating a bureaucratic infrastructure behind it to require lots of testing and lots of licensing. And so it's becoming a little bit more, uh, I'm gonna say lawn worky in, its, in it, how they're trying to implement it and control it uh, now that the big boys are, are deeply invested in BACnet. So just from an equipment standpoint, it's, 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 not, uh, it's not something you guys necessarily have to worry about, but it is gonna affect you later on down the road as the, the people have to make decisions about how much money they're willing to spend to maintain their backnet system for just maintaining these licenses. So again, it was open source. Green building, whoops, sorry. Green buildings, uh, it, it, it is, every, it's everybody's, you know, we talk about leads and all that. This is part of that. Backnet protocol is set up specifically to capture data points about uh, the things that let us be green buildings. Uh, pros, very popular, new buildings. Uh, more and more devices are coming online. However, I think that's going to taper off a little bit because they've implemented uh, their testing protocols about 50 grand by the time you get done. And then there's yearly licensing to be left onto their list. It's just a matter of if the manufacturers are going to be willing to keep paying that sort of stuff to have the little back net sticker, or if they're just going to say, it's open source coding. I don't need your silly little sticker as long as my stuff works. So there's, and there's no federal or law control. It's, it's just a standard. Um, ready, readily flexible with twisted pair, so it can actually, there's a twisted pair format, wire to wire, but this is the one that's coming online really nicely, the Ethernet, the BACnet IP interfaces. That's kind of handy when a building that's already got a bunch of Ethernet cables run all over the place. And it's been adopted by all the major integrators. Uh, cons, more manufacturers are making proprietary device and system specific command sets, meaning uh, when we recently integrated with Siemens, the Siemens integrator looked at us and said, hey, I've been doing this five years and I've never hooked up a device that wasn't a Siemens device on my BACnet network. Understand, he's been doing big buildings and never hooked up a non-Siemens BACnet device. So we kind of scratched our head and we said, well, you just do it like this, right? And he goes, yep. So the integration wasn't the issue, but that's kind of where the big boys have gone. They've really created a, a, their own little sales funnel of devices and they're adapting their own devices to make sure that 
that goes into these uh, major systems. Um, conversion of the interface with old systems does require some external devices. So if I want to bring, uh, uh, I've got a whole investment in a bunch of Modbus equipment, Modbus-based equipment, but I want to bring the information into my BACnet system, that requires a conversion device. There are a lot of manufacturers out there that make these, but they are fiddly. They are, you're converting one format to another format. And sidebar, uh, the, and as an example, in LawnWorks, when a, a, an on-off switch operates, we have a, that defined, and that actually starts with 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. Those are the conditions for a, an on switch that's also considered a level switch, off, uh, low level, mid level, high level, uh, on entirely. So, so those are those are your steps. Well, in BACnet, they start their numbering system at one, one, two, three, four, five. So now, see, the math is off by one. I can't just hand that piece of information off to from one system to another system in that same format. So I have to have a conversion a device that understands that zero in LawnWorks is one in BACnet when I convert it to the specific kind of item. So. Those devices are out there. There's a few people that are specializing in it, but I don't see all of them doing the whole uh, certified backnet thing because those individual devices are relatively inexpensive and it's gonna be hard to justify putting big bucks into them, especially since it's a relatively small market. Um, there's a lot of point and click integration engineers. We have discovered this and it is not favorable to you, the water treater or us, the equipment manufacturer. Uh, when you go on site and you've, you've actually presented the equipment, you've got the controller you want, it's gonna do the cool stuff you need it to do. It goes to integrate with the BACnet system. And if that doesn't work as smoothly or as easily or as uh, um, specialized proprietary in his system, as he, again, the example of the Siemens guy, uh, if he can't click it and make it work exactly, that guy freaks out. He has no idea what to do next. Uh, so you end up going up two and three levels and find an actual system engineer and he's, oh, click this, twirl this and, and do this three times and that's how we do this. The guy in the field that's doing this, the site installation doesn't know that, isn't at that level. Uh, so there are a lot of point and click integration engineers and uh, they will slow you down. One of the other things to remember, when I, and the reason I kind of allude to the point and click engineer is that the, the uh, um, when, Johnson or Siemens or these bigger companies proposed this system. They didn't want to include your, your, your control system. They wanted to design and implement the cooling tower control as part of their, their overall system. Now understand when they, when they proposed that to the customer, that's 30 or $40,000 worth of engineering time, PLCs to do it a very specific way. And then the, but the spec is written where it may control, uh, offer a controller that you guys are familiar with. And then, and that controller has more flexibility than they would design in. So in the end, they lose out on that proposition. They this by the controller and it'll talk to the system, right? That becomes the winning argument. And because of that, they may be reticent or also a little, a little bitey about uh, having to integrate this other device that's not one of their devices onto their system. Uh, run across it consistently, uh, but because it's not our first rodeo and most of the other manufacturers, it won't be their first rodeo, just get them on the phone. We're going to walk you through it. Um, and again, the, one of the last item is there's attempts at, uh, by this governing body to become very pre-cert, retest, really a bureaucratic nightmare. Some guys decided they were going to be, wanted to be back net guys full time, and that requires salary. So there's all a lot of fees going on. Um, it's going to be interesting, again, how the manufacturers, device manufacturers um, play along with this or whether they just look at it and go, I don't understand what we're doing here. It's an open source. Everything's documented. Why am I paying you? So um, expansion of data points. So the benefits of these systems, it isn't just that they're like the old 4 to 20 milliamp where it just followed one particular uh, item from a remote device. So the, the picture I'd showed you previously of that conductivity uh, node hooked to a conductivity sensor. So, you know, its primary purpose here, and I'll hop to the next slide because if everybody's had a chance to read this one, whoops, maybe I won't. Okay, it's two, it's two down, so let's do this again. So as an example, a conductivity probe, a 4 to 20 milliamp transmitter goes up and down with it. If you needed to calibrate or configure or do some sort of alarm, that's either got to occur in an outside device or at the local device if it's got some sort of indicator on it. 
but that information, these extra pieces of information are not available. You can't transmit them or use them. The connectivity nodes, like that, that one we showed you, have a remarkable amount of, of, of what we call snippets, data packets, besides just the connectivity that tell us what it's doing, but also allow us to plow back into it and reconfigure it remotely or as part of the network function. So these, this chart here, are all the variables that are sent over that data stream. So the one in yellow is my connectivity reading. That's the one thing that the 4 to 20 milliamp type signal would have given me. Now, when I put this into my building management system, I now have all kinds of things I can do, set ranges, change how it works with specific probes remotely. I can actually have it uh, send alarm flags by itself. There, you see this list. I can do remote cal calibrations and local calibrations. I can do a single point or a, or, or a large point. I can actually pull extra readings off of it. So that's very cool for what this note, why these nodes are, are a little more flexible and a little more uh, usable and probably the future versus the 4 to 20 milliamp single point device. And again, it's the same pair of wires and, and not again, that set of wires isn't specific to that one device. I can put multiple wires on that same or multiple devices on that same set of twisted pair wires when we talk about these remote devices using the newer technologies. Okay, so let's talk about the streets. The streets is how the devices, our controllers, are going to send information to the building management system. And there's a couple of ways this has been approached, and I've talked to other manufacturers at some of the, the events. And uh, the first foray, and our first foray, is we were going to make it a two-way street, meaning all the functions, or as many of the functions as possible in the controller for doing setups and set points and all that good stuff, as well as the readings and the current configuration and the way things were running in the controller, all of that going back and forth so that the BACnet integrator could then pull in and allow for putting set points in remotely and all that through their BACnet system. That falls on its rear end pretty quickly because there's, there's hierarchies and there's the way it runs through the menu. And in discussions with water treatment companies, especially the service providers, did they want that third shift operator looking at something and screwing with a setting through the BACnet system that he probably should have talked to somebody before he changed anyways. So the two-way street was a large initial integration nightmare. And everything, like we said, between Siemens and Tritium, everybody's done their own little tweak. So each of the little protocols may not have been set up the way they wanted it to. And we knew that on our specific device, there were steps you took in a particular order to make things work out. So the two-way street wasn't the right way to go, we didn't think. More discussions with water treaters. Uh, we went for option number three, but let's talk about option number two. Option number two was we send from the controller all the things that it's currently doing, all the readings, the water meters, which relays are on, all that stuff. And then we allow partial control. They could maybe operate a relay remotely. They could maybe reset uh, a particular reading to zero, uh, real limited, you know, change the date and time, real limited sort of stuff. So that we'll call a limited two-way. Uh, the problem with the limited two-way was they were like, well, if we do some of this, can, can we do more? So you're right back in that conversation again. And then you're talking about kind of customizing uh, all these tables so that they can integrate and you're on to number one again. A lot of cost, a lot of time and effort. And then there's, you're just allowing more opportunity for something to get dropped out or changed over time that you have to deal with later. So we went with option number three. And it's actually been after the initial grumble from the, the BMS guys that they're not getting all the control they want, it's actually worked out well for the water treater and the site because it's given them the level of control and monitoring that they needed. What we do is we send on a, three, on a, on a one way street now, we're gonna send all the readings from the controller, the, everything that's going on with it right now. Here's everything that this thing is doing. We are not gonna allow you to come back into it and make any changes to the BMS, but through either a browser-based or locally to the controller, you can go in there and operate the system just like you're at the controller, but that's got a password on it. And that's the password that the water treatment company typically installs or writes in there and gives to the primary people so that they know what they can get in there and do things. And at, at that point too, the, these, with these newer control systems, the water treater can go in remotely and, and do the monitoring over the uh, internet as well. So that, that's the direction that we went. I think some of the manufacturers may go back to that as well. Uh, I think that there can be some success in the in the the uh, item two, which is kind of the limited two-way. Um, 
but you know, give an inch and they'll take a mile kind of thing. We we've, we've kind of held our ground on it. Uh, we'll see how it goes. We'll see how it goes over time. Uh, for the controller, the water, the one street, like I said, we is we are we think it's the best, and we do eliminate the extraneous console jockey midshift guy from uh, uh, going too nuts. And the two way does require a lot of pre and post uh, installation support. Uh, offsite data. This is becoming a big deal, and uh, we've had some uh, some conversations with property management folks. Uh, so the local building management system is collecting the data and they're making changes and alterations. That data is being used by the water treatment company to provide the services that they provide. So everything's good there. But the property may be owned by a company in uh, Nebraska. And they actually have the remoting BMS system, like a remoting backnet, where they want to, they buy a property, they bring their backnet system in. So now the, the local system needs to talk to that backnet system. So that they can actually monitor it from this central place. They want to look at all their properties instantaneously and see what's going on at each property. And it isn't just the water treatment equipment. This is everything going on at the properties from these centralized data collection points. Um, the cool part about having the controller that does that is uh, you can you can integrate into that through the BMS. But what we're, we've also found is that these uh, property management companies they may be in one format buy a property that's in another format like Modbus or, or predominantly Lawnworks, and now they're having a twisty twirly uh, integration fight with their own folks. Um, we, we went at another way, we just put all the three languages in the control system. So we actually are talking to the local BMS in one language and talking to the property management folks in another language. But since it's a one way street that we talked about, we're sending everybody the same stuff. So everybody's getting to read the stuff live that they want to and giving the water treater the access he wants over the ethernet. So, but this, this is this has become a bigger and bigger deal This remote property management uh, companies wanting to look at energy usage, water usage, uh, that things are being properly maintained. And again, it's not just the water treatment equipment, it's everything. So kind of a, kind of a neat deal um, and, and it's good that we're gonna be part of it. Uh, let's see, I think that pretty much covers it. Um, one of the things that's become a, a, a real concern uh, is as we integrate devices that a water treatment company may need to remotely access, uh, the BMS people do not want Ethernet World Wide Web connecti connectivity to their BMS system. Uh, we all hear the horror stories of uh, where hackers infiltrated a particular building or a particular facility and did very bad things. They did that through an open port somewhere. So when you talk to a BMS guy, a building management system guy, especially their IT guy, and you say, hey, uh, you need to poke a hole in the internet so that this water treatment company can access this controller and, and look at it remotely so it can send out email alerts and that sort of thing, the BMS guy freaks out. Uh, so the way you kind of hop over that is with a bridge and it's very cool and it's like uh, shown here the controller is using a 3g uh, uh, wireless internet connection that everybody can have access to with a password to the water treatment company or the customer and then the backnet is run over ip into a backnet uh, server that has twisted pair as an output the server then acts as a security bridge because there's no way to hack through the ethernet to the twisted pair to go over the twisted pair into the BMS and do any damage in any sort of system format. So this, this is a great solution that allows the water treatment company to still have that remote access. Nobody had a, a hole poked in their firewall so this, that security concern goes away and you're not on their network uh, so that the bane of our existence, the IT guy doesn't mess with us. Um, quick sidebar on that. Uh, IT guys, whenever we uh, we notice that whenever we do uh, controllers, about three years down the road, if they're not on a 3G remote and they're on the actual customer's uh, uh, network, about three years down the road, you know, we get the phone call. It's not talking. I can't access it. It's not sending emails anymore. And we, you know, the water treaters on the site. We're talking with them. Uh, boy, everything changed. What the heck's going on? We asked, and the the new IT guy came in. And he didn't like the way the old IT had it set up. So what he did is he shuffled all the ports and put them the way he likes them. And in doing so, he knocked our controller offline and blocked off ports that our controller had, had set up forever so that the water treater could access it. So to avoid that, 
happening and it will happen. Uh, one of the things is these, these 3G uh, wireless can plug them in anywhere systems that allow you to hang on the outside of the building, not be part of that infrastructure for the customer site, but still be able to, like you said, through this bridge, provide them every piece of information they want to see for the monitoring purposes. So that's why this, uh, this, the, uh, the security concern is out there. If you're part of their network, they're really worried about your device, uh, but we can do a, you can do a bridge and not be part of the network and hand them everything they need to be handed. So, um, integration steps and concerns. This is kind of towards the end here. Uh, universal and standardized is not universal and standardized, uh, like I said before, because the larger companies have done some really specific shell stuff, reserving addresses for themselves. Their devices do it a particular way. They add their own little twist and twirl. Uh, to make them a value add for the customer and also to make it harder for the customer to step away from them. So, uh, you know, keep that in mind when, when you see a spec that says uh, Modbus based controller, BACnet based controller, you need to keep reading and there should be some qualifiers on that sort of style of language. Uh, MSTP means it's a master slow can tape and it's twisted pair. Uh, the other one is TCP IP, that's more of your ethernet connectivity. One of these should probably be asked, one of those particular definitions, MSTP or TCP IP, should be after these major callouts, whether it's Modbus or BACnet. If it just says BACnet and you're going to bid it, you better have a conversation with the site that you're bidding for about the additional protocol information. That you just need to, because otherwise the BACnet IP controller will arrive and they'll look at you and go, hey man, we're all twisted pair. How do I connect to that? Or vice versa. You know, you put the twisted pair in and they go, hey, man, we're all Ethernet. So just understand that. Now, there's converters out there. Like I said, there's ways to do it, like I said, but that's all after it. And in their mind, you didn't meet their spec. So ask a few more qualifying questions. The other side of that is get the manufacturer of the equipment involved. Just get them involved as early as possible. Uh, they're there to support you and answer your questions and also ha act as your knowledge guy on this geek stuff. And we, we will talk uh, uh, BMS geek to geek with the, the site and make sure that, that everybody's on the same page for the, the correct equipment and what's going to be preset before the uh, hardware arrives. Uh, well, the other thing we've discovered is plug and play is never plug and play. And the, grid, and the integrators always underbid the amount of time they're going to spend working with the equipment. And almost universally, every one of them has said, I didn't, I didn't bid this. I didn't bid to spend this much time doing this. Well, this much time is 10 minutes. Click here, do this. Well, I didn't bid that. Okay, <laughs> that's not my problem, but it is a, it's become almost a universal uh, thing. And this goes back to them really have, have wanting, wanted to, in the first place, integrated the control systems for the cooling towers and the boilers. Uh, be, very, be the manufacturer's eyes, ears, hands during the bid process, but also as you go to integrate this, you're going to see a lot of terminology and a lot of uh, integration um, firmware, software used that you've never seen before. But if you get the manufacturer on the line and, and describe what's going on, we can walk you through the things to make sure that, that the integration goes smoothly. And I will say this, once the BACnet stuff is up and running, the, the, the lawn work stuff is up and running, barring the, their ethernet shuffle, the stuff just goes out there and does its job. So you really don't have to mess with it. Other than that initial setup, there's not a lot you have to do unless you've done we'll backtracking there to that two-way system. Then there's a lot of screwing up with that. There's, there's just a people tweaking things that don't need to be tweaked and that puts a lot more variables into the equation. So we're finding really reliably not getting additional phone calls about the functionality or the loss of signal until an IT guy gets involved and starts hacking off the addresses. So, um, and now uh, that's kind of my quick run through. I probably got through that a little faster than I had intended, but uh, so uh, let's take some questions. Great, thanks Tom. If people have questions, they can go ahead and just type it in that chat box and we will get to those. Um, one thing to note, this webinar is being recorded and it will be up on the members only section of the website a little bit later today. And we will also be sending out um, a PDF version of Tom's presentation. So we'll give people just a few more minutes to go ahead and type their questions in.
Is this, is this the, the part where we play the uh, the Jeopardy uh, background music? Da, 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 yeah. da, da. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> you can start telling us one of your short stories, Tom. Oh, there you go. That's what I'll do. I'll crack my sci fi book and start reading to you guys if you don't I don't see some questions here pretty quick. <laughs> <laughs> well we had a comment. Someone said no questions, but it was very helpful. So thank you, Tom. Oh, very cool. All right, well, I'm not seeing that there's any questions right now. Um, so I guess if you have any, um, Tom's information is on the screen right there, and you can go ahead and shoot him an email or give him a call, and he can answer any questions that you have. It was a great uh, presenting. Thanks for giving the uh, opportunity here. I hope some people got some information that they can run with, and uh, at least they are on a, as a cautionary tale as they're going into their next job, they, they know to ask some, uh, some questions and know when they need to get us involved. So that that's very cool. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, Tom. Thanks, everybody. All right, we'll talk to you guys later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.